are our teacher. You are our father. And so we look to you now as a loving father to teach us in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, Matthew chapter 7, verse 13. Here we go. It says, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. Many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, narrow is the way which leads unto life, and few there be that find it. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth evil fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast in the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. Not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock, and the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew, beat upon that rock. It fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. Everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. The rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell. And great was the fall of it. And it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. So here we are, we're in Matthew chapter 7, which like, which, 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 which like all of the Sermon Amount, is, is filled with directions. Directions what to do, what not to do in life. And if we take one step back in this chapter and ask one simple question, what is this chapter about? What is chapter 7, how can we summarize it? How can we put it all together? And what means is that we could summarize chapter 7 as he's finishing up on the Sermon on the Mount, with one simple description, and that is how to get to heaven. That's really what chapter 7 is all about, how to get to heaven. And that with that in mind, we can see how he's now teaching that the first step to getting to heaven is to turn away from sin, to turn away from self. Turn away from the self in verses 1 through 5 that looks at others, judges others, and condemns others. That's what verses 1 through 5 is all about. Turn away from the self that does not want to do to others what self wants done to them. Turn away from the self that, that, that does not want to listen to that voice inside, that little voice inside that's pleading for the person in front of us who needs something. And, and so the first step to getting to heaven is to turn away from self. This is the first step that Zacchaeus took when, he, when he, his first words when he spoke to the Lord in Luke 19.8 Luke 19, 8, where it says, Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. That's Zacchaeus turn, taking that first step. That first step that he took on the road to heaven was to turn away from self that does not want to give anything to anyone. So the first step that he takes is he turns away from self that has wrongly accused people to get gain. That's the first step. That's repentance. And the second step is to turn to God. And this is what verse 7 is all about when it says, Ask, and it shall be given unto you. And seek, and you shall find. And knock, and it shall be opened unto you. So this verse 7 is all about asking and, and, and for and, and seeking what is desired for and wanting something to be opened up. So it's all about, and, and, and it has a basis, and he explained this about the father who's not going to withhold good gifts from his child. So the basis for this assurance of asking and, and, and seeking and pleading is this assurance that God has the same love has the same affection for his children that an earthly father does or a mother does for her nursing child, as it says in Isaiah 49, 15. Isaiah 49, 15, God asks the question, can a woman forget her sucking child that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, they may forget, yet will I not 
forget thee. So these are the representations that God has given for us to keep in mind when we come to him in prayer. The representations, the symbols, an affectionate father, a nursing mother. And what's being asked for when he says ask? Well, Psalm 50 verse 15, Psalm 50 verse 15 says it this way, where God says, call upon me in the day of trouble and I will deliver thee and thou shalt glorify me. God's asking, God's, God's saying, look, just call on me, ask me. I'm the deliverer. You're going to de- glorify me for how I've delivered you. That's how it is. What is a person seeking in verse 7? Seeking. Well, the Lord said, he made the invitation in Isaiah 55, 6. Isaiah 55, 6. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. So when you realize that God is speaking this to the Jewish people, you realize that God's been waiting thousands of years for his people Israel to seek him, and he's looking forward to that day. God has a great anticipation, and he talks about that day that's coming in Jeremiah 29, 12, Jeremiah 25, 12, where he says to Israel, then you shall call upon me, you shall go and pray unto me, I will hearken unto you. You shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all of your heart. And I will be found of you, saith the Lord. So this is really a striking statement here as you see God longing. He's longing with all of his heart to make himself known to Israel. He's just waiting for them to come with all heart. Kolev, Caleb, as we say, all heart. Now, verse 7, he says, knock. He says knock. It's an amazing thing in the scriptures to see the Lord asking us to knock when he's the one who's knocking in Revelation 3.19. Revelation 3.19, he says, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. So he's knocking on the door of hearts of men. And he's telling us that we should knock. And what is, the, what, what is the purpose of the knocking? What is the opening that he wants to see happen? He says in Revelation 3.20 very clearly, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. So that's what's meant in verse 7. It's when the Lord Jesus is saying, ask and seek and knock, it's all ask for deliverance from trouble so that you can glorify God. Seek the Lord himself and knock to have that fellowship with him. And that's what it's all about. So this movement in this passage, as we've seen, of this asking, and then it goes to seeking, and then it goes to knocking, it shows this genuine prayer doesn't sit still. Genuine prayer progresses more and more to a state of urgency. And there's one picture in the scripture that paints this so well, of this picture of urgency, and it's that one night in the life of Jacob. When Jacob was left all alone, with this threat that Esau's coming to murder him, to slaughter him and his family. He's in a night of desperation. God comes to Jacob in the form of a man, and God wrestles with Jacob all night long until finally the morning light is breaking through, just breaking through. And God, in the form of a man, says to Jacob, I have to go. I have to go. He wanted to leave. And Jacob says, no. Jacob defies. Jacob protests. Jacob says, no. In Genesis 32, 24, Genesis 32, 40, 24, where it says, Jacob was left alone. There wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. When he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh. The hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. He said, let me go, for the day breaketh. He said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. He said unto him, what is thy name? He said, Jacob, he said, thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel, for as a prince hast thou power with God and with men and hast prevailed. Jacob asked him and said, tell me, I pray thee, thy name. He said, wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? And he blessed him there. Jacob called the name of the place, Peniel. He said, I have seen the face of God. I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved. So Jacob there says to God, no, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Jacob was asking for deliverance, for deliverance from Esau, who was coming to kill him. And, 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 and that's, that was Jacob asking. And then Jacob wasn't just happy to walk away with that blessing, but Jacob developed a sincere, special interest 
in God who had delivered him. And that's what's all behind when he said in verse 29, Genesis 32, 29, Jacob asked him and said, tell me, I pray thee thy name. He's not just happy to have his request granted. He now takes an interest in God. He wants to know God's name. That's Jacob seeking God. And then Jacob goes on to glorify God by saying that God has preserved my life. You should call on me. I will answer thee. You will glorify me. That's what he does. He goes on in, in Genesis 32, 30. Jacob calls the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved. He goes from that place, from that night, from that place of Peniel. He travels on. He makes almost a beeline in the next chapter, Genesis 33, 18. Genesis 33, 18, where it says, Jacob came to Shalom, a city in Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan. And when he came from Pedanaram and pitched his tent before the city, he bought a parcel of a field which he had spread his tent at the hand of the children of Hamor, Shechem, Shechem's father, for a hundred pieces of money. And he erected there an altar, and he called it El Elohe Yisrael. So Jacob builds an altar to have fellowship with God. And, and Jacob calls God by a new name that he's never called him before, El Elohe Yisrael. God is the God of Israel, or Jacob. God is the God of Israel. Jacob making that altar for fellowship with God was Jacob calling God, and Jacob was therefore knocking on God's door, saying, I want to be with you. I want to have fellowship with you. Now, this is Jacob asking, seeking, and knocking. And so as a result, Jacob is now crowned with a new name. He's got a new name, Israel. It's all of what's behind it. There's a man who was earnestly asking, seeking, and knocking, and he gets the name Israel, all because he said in Genesis 32, 26, 32, 26, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. Now, that was Jacob. But now, what about everybody else? When does a person really engage in this asking, seeking, and knocking? No one is going to engage in verse 7 in asking, seeking, and knocking unless they have a strong sense within them. A strong sense, in order for a person really to engage in this asking for God and seeking God and knocking for fellowship with God, a person has to have a strong sense of not having God. Of, of not having eternal life. A person has to have a strong sense that he's really standing outside. He's not inside. He's outside of God. A person has to have a strong sense that, 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 that the crowd that's being spoken about in verse 14 is on the wrong road, and he doesn't want to be on that road. Now, the Lord then goes on in verses 13 to 14 and says that there are two roads. He says there's two roads. He says, enter in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, broad is the way, leads to destruction. Many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, narrow is the way which leads to life, and few there be that find it. Few there be that find it. When it says few there be that find it, you can't help but think about Israel wandering in the desert. Millions of people wandering in the desert at this time. Only two of that generation go into the land. Only two, just Joshua and Caleb. All the rest die off. So the Lord says there's two roads. And the thing about these two roads is that he describes both of those roads go into eternity. Just two roads. There's not a third road. There's not a third road that goes to nowhere. There's not a third road that leads to annihilation or a ceasing to exist or a ceasing to be. There's two roads, and both of these roads go into eternity. One road goes to life and heaven for eternity, and the other one goes to death and hell for eternity. But both of the roads go into eternity, an eternal death, an eternal existence in hell, or an eternal life, an eternal existence in heaven. So only one road goes to heaven, not many roads to heaven, just one road, just as there was just one entrance into the tabernacle, one gate into the tabernacle where God was in the wilderness of Sinai. That's what it says in Exodus 27, 16, Exodus 27, 16. The gate of the court. Not many gates, just the gate, one gate. Anyone who wanted to go into the tabernacle had to go through that gate that way. The gate of the tabernacle, is, it was the illustration behind what the Lord said in John 10, 7. John 10, 7, then said Jesus unto them, 
Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door. I am the door of the sheep. He said in John 10, 9, John 10, 9, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. So single gate to the tabernacle as illustrated by the Lord Jesus. And he said, really speaking about, really thinking, you can see him thinking about this single gate into the tabernacle when he said in John 14, 4, or John 14, 4, he says, he says, whither I go, you know, the way you know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Only one gate into the tabernacle. Only one gate into the road that leads to heaven that he's referring to here in, in, in chapter 7. Only, and, and the Lord Jesus is the door. He says in John 14, 6, No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So there's two roads. They lead to eternity. Only one leads to heaven. That's it. One road leads to heaven. That's the reason the Lord Jesus says, Go in that way. Enter into that narrow gate. Go into that narrow road that leads to heaven. As a matter of fact, the Lord Jesus didn't just say go, but, but, but he said in, in another passage, Luke, which we'll see, he said strive, fight, struggle to, go, to get into this life. I remember a conversation I had with, with Mike Johnson when I told him first about 10 years ago that I had cancer. I had stage 4 non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and Mike said to me these words. I never forgot it. Mike said to me, Tom, don't give up. Fight for life. Life is precious. It's worth fighting for. Don't give up. That's what he told me. Well, now Mike has been diagnosed just recently with stage 4 liver cancer, and, 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 and the doctors are giving Mike no hope. And when Mike was thinking of that, just giving up and going on, Mike remembered what he told me. He told me on the phone. He says, Tom, I remember what I told you when I told you fight for life. Life is precious. It's worth fighting for. So that's what he's decided to do. And that's what the Lord Jesus is really saying here in verse 13 when he says, enter ye in at the straight, at the straight gate. Fight for eternal life. Eternal life is precious. It's worth fighting for. And this idea of of fighting, as I mentioned, is in Luke 13. Luke 13, 24, and assume in a parallel passage, he uses the, the word strive, strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. This is the word strive, behind this word strive is the idea of fight, struggle. And so the Lord Jesus reveals when he says this in Luke 13, 24, he reveals a terrible scene a scene of people of des in desperation, a scene of people fighting to do anything to get into heaven, only to hear the most terrible words, you cannot, it's too late, you are too late, you, you squandered your opportunity and it's gone now. There is no second chance, there is no purgatory, there is no temporary stay in hell and then a transfer to heaven. Death, at death, everything is final. It reminds me of this desperate scene, and you all saw it too, when, when, when Saigon was falling to the North Vietnamese. And there were the, Viet, the South Vietnamese, and they were pressing against the gate of the American embassy, trying to get on that helicopter that was going to go out to sea to the aircraft carrier. And, 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 and so therefore, the Lord uses this term, fight for it, strive. It raises the question of what are we fighting against? What, 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 what obstacles are in the way to going to heaven? What are the, what, what are the problems? What are, what, why is it so narrow? Well, first of all, he said, as he said in Matthew 17, he, he goes on to describe uh, uh, Matthew 7, 7, verse 13. He, he, he talks about the narrow gate versus the wide gate, the narrow way versus the wide way, and, 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 and then he goes on to talk about false prophets, so here are some difficulties that, 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 that are in front of, of, of going into the narrow way. First of all, it's difficult for a person to accept that the gate of heaven is so narrow that it has to go through one person, the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, what about all the other people who follow Buddha and, and Hinduism and Islam? How, how can you reconcile all those people with the fact that there's only one narrow gate, none narrow way through the Lord Jesus so, this is a, so, so the first obstacle is to say, the gate's too narrow. The gate's too narrow. It's too narrow. It doesn't include Buddhists and Hindus and, and, and Muslims and so forth. So that's the first difficulty to accept that Jesus is the only way to heaven. Second difficulty to that gate is, 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 is that 
the way is that the way that leads the way that leads to destruction is very wide. The, and the, it, it, it's very the wide gate, the wide road. They seem to be all inclusive. They include everybody, every lifestyle, all sorts of sins. Everybody's okay. Everybody's welcome. It seems so loving to not exclude anyone from, from the way. And so the gate's wide, the road's wide. It's difficult to, to overcome and realize that that wide gate, that wide road is leading to destruction. It's the wrong way. That's difficult. That's a big obstacle because we, we, when we look over that wide gate and that wide road, you know who we see on there? We see our friends. We see our family members. It's difficult to say, well, they're all on the way to destruction. But see, and, and seeing that gate is so narrow, it's difficult to, to find many, many different ways. That, that, that you can't find many different ways that all lead to heaven. It's difficult. Yeah, and, and so this has to be fought through. This has to be battled through. It's a difficulty. And when a person starts and goes through that narrow gate, is on the narrow road, oftentimes it means he's leaving friends. He's leaving family. That's a severing of relationships. Maybe he doesn't want it, but it just happens. And, and as, as Peter said in 1 Peter 4.4, 4, 1 Peter 4.4, 4, they think it's strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. I mean, they're saying, come on. And then you're saying, I can't. And that's a parting. That's a parting right there. OK. What is it? Such a dramatic point, Scott, that it made it <laughs> <laughs> Scott sounds the symbol. Okay, so that's just like Abraham, who was called by God in Genesis 12.1. Genesis 12.1, in that, in that he, God said, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, from thy kindred, from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. This is the famous Lech Lecha passage here, very, the famous part where God literally, when he says lech lecha, he says, you go you. When Abraham went through that narrow gate, that narrow path, and God told him, you, you're going to leave your country, you're going to leave your family, you're going to leave your people, you're going to go to a land that I'm going to show you, that was difficult. That was difficult for Abraham. He had to fight his way through. He had to strive on his journey. But the wonderful fact is, in Genesis 12.4, Genesis 12.4, very simple words, so Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him. Not easy, but he fought. The next difficulty, in this wide way, we kind of mentioned it here, verse 13, many there be which go thereat. And about the narrow way, in verse, verse 14, few there be that find it. That's, that's difficult to, 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 to reconcile, to realize that, that, that there are so many on the wrong way, on the, on the wrong way, the broad way, and, and how can they all be wrong? And there are so few on the narrow way. How could they be the only ones that are right? After all, the wide way is so attractive, it's so alluring, and that's a difficulty. And the narrow way seems to be so restrictive. Another difficulty, I can't do the things I used to do. There are so many prohibitions. There's so, many, uh, uh, so much I have to say, well, others can. I cannot. That's difficult. It has to be fought through. And then the Lord comes to another difficulty in striving the way, in striving to get into the narrow way. He says in verse 15, beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. This is an obstacle that has to be fought through. This is an obstacle that there are so many false prophets of religion who all claim to lead their followers to happiness, to heaven. But these, these, these false prophets, he's saying they're dangerous because they're false. That means that they give a false comfort. Everything's going to be okay. You're going to be fine. No problem between you and God. These are false prophets. These, prof these prophets are, are dangerous because what he said in verse 15, which come to you. They're dangerous because they're reaching out to people to follow them. They're dangerous because they come in sheep's clothing. They don't, they don't look like what they are, but they are deceivers. They are deceptive. It says in 2 Corinthians 11, 13, 2 Corinthians 11, 13, such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. No marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it's no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. So they're dangerous because they come in sheep's clothing, because they transform, them, transform themselves into teachers of truth. 
They're dangerous because there's one common denial among these false prophets, very common denial that they teach, and it's given to us in 2 Peter 2.1. 2 Peter 2.1. These were also false prophets among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, and here's the key, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. That key, even denying the Lord that bought them. In Jude 1.4, Jude 1.4 says, they are a certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. See, when it talks about this denying the Lord, denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ, it means they're denying the deity of Christ. They're denying that Jesus is God. Mormons deny the deity of the Lord by saying that we're all going to be gods. Jehovah Witnesses, JWs, they deny the deity of the Lord by saying that he was only a man. This is the truth. This is God. This is the Lord Jesus Christ. This is man. That's true. This is what the Bible teaches. What Mormons do is they raise man up to this level and so deny the deity, of unique deity of, of Christ. What, what, what Jehovah Witnesses do is they bring him down. Just as simple as that. These are false prophets. These are false prophets. Mormonism, JW, many other false prophets typically deny the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's so dangerous because it says in Romans 10.9, Romans 10.9, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God had raised him from the dead, thou shalt be, be, be saved. When it talks about confessing the Lord Jesus, it's talking about confessing that Jesus is God. And when false prophets deny that Jesus is God, it's very dangerous, very dangerous. Now, in the next verses, verses 16 to 20, the Lord Jesus now tells us how we can identify, how we can recognize, how we can see these are false prophets. And what he's saying here is that sooner or later, the unclean devil who is motivating them will lead those people to some unclean practice. It may be some sexual immorality. It may be some other practice where they'll be seen as bringing forth evil fruits, as he calls it. Basically, the Lord Jesus is saying, watch their lives. Don't just listen to what they're teaching. Watch their lives. And it will become evident that they're false teachers because of, the la because of evil fruit. He says in verse 15, they're dangerous because, he says in verse 15, inwardly they are ravening wolves. He's saying that there's a latent aggression in them. There's a disguised anger in them. There's a goal to destroy under the surface of these sheep's clothing. And so what he's saying is that watch for it. Look out for the, the, look at the person behind the teaching to identify the false prophet. Basically, the bottom line of what the Lord is saying here is verse 20, whereby by their fruits you shall know them. So the Lord here has been, has been in his teaching warning about how false prophets deceive. The subject is deception now. He's talking about false prophets and their, and their deception how they see now, he stays on the subject of deception here, and he, he, this is a false prophet deceiving others. But the subject is deception. Now, he moves on to a situation where, where the issue is now the deceived or those who are self-deceived. This is a situation where people are sincere. They're very sincere, but they're wrong. This is, a situa this is the problem of self-deception, which he explains now in verse 21. Verse 21, when he says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. So again, from it's necessary for a person to believe that Jesus is God, but just because a person may call Jesus God or Lord does not mean that he's going to heaven. And a person may recite perfectly these creeds, like the, like the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed, for example, uh, the great words, we believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, all things visible and invisible, one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, begotten from God, the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God. So a person may have learned that, may be reciting that often, but that doesn't mean he's going to heaven. Because there's a sobering statement 
which the Lord makes in verse 21 when he says, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, what makes this even more serious about what he said is that he said that those who call Jesus God are not necessarily going to heaven. They're, 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 in fact, those who are going to heaven are a small number, he says in verse 22 and verse 23. He says, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work in iniquity. That's very sobering. It's a very sobering warning. So many people, he says, call Jesus God, and they have the worst self-deception possible because they sincerely believe they're going to heaven when they're not. But they believe they're going to heaven. And if you ask them, they will say, I'm 100% sure that I'm going to heaven. They will say, there's no doubt about it. They're gonna, he says, I'm going to a better place. They say, I'm going to heaven when I die. They may even have in their Bible a date written down in which they prayed the sinner's prayer. They can tell you the time and place where they bowed their heads. They told God, I'm a sinner. They told God, I believe that Jesus is God. They told God, I believe that Jesus came to earth and died for my sins and rose again. They can tell you that they did everything, and so they're supposed to get into heaven, and, and they're calling Jesus Lord, but they're deceived. They're part of the, not necessarily, I'm just saying there are some, but many, he says in verse 21 and 22, who call Jesus Lord, not going into heaven, because he's going to say in verse 23, I never knew you. Wow. That's a dilemma. That's a problem. That it's possible for a person to be so deceived as to done everything he should be doing, as to call Jesus Lord, think he's got the, everything checked off on the, on the requirements, and then he gets cast into hell. That's a problem. That's a real problem. And so it, 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 it's possible for, this kind of leads you to think, well, it's possible for a person to regularly attend a good Bible-believing church, a good Bible-believing church, preaching church, call Jesus Lord, be cast into hell? Wow, that's an issue. That's a real issue. So that leaves us with a burning question. What is a person supposed to do to make sure that they're a part of the, sm of the small group going to heaven and not a part of the many who are calling Jesus Lord and being cast into hell? I mean, how can a person be sure that he's not part of this large, self-deceived group uh, calling Jesus Lord who are really destined for hell? Well, the great thing is here that the Lord has not left us hanging on this issue and, and how to be sure that, uh, 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 that, that not to be a part of the self-deceived, hell-bound group that called Jesus Lord. The Lord Jesus has told us in verse 21 how to not be self-deceived when he said, verse 21, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Okay, great. What is the will of the Father? What, what do I got to do? What, where, what are the commandments that I got to do? What, what are they exactly so I get into heaven? What's the minimum requirements? Okay, So he's told us what the will of the Father was. The will of the Father, he said in John 6.40, John, John 6.40, he said, this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I'll raise him up the last day. The key to what he's saying here, same in John 3, 16, is this believe on him. Everything on that phrase, believe on him, is hinging on one little word. It's the word on, believe on him. And this is where the Greek is so critical here. And, 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 and because the Greek word translated on is the word ice, which means into. You know, normally I don't do this with the Greek so much, and, but this is important here. This is very important. This word on is the word into. Ice is the word. Ice is used 829 times in the New Testament. 576, 70% of the times that it's used, it's translated into. The first time ice is used in the New Testament was in the history of the wise men that traveled far to bring gifts to Jesus. In Matthew 2.11, Matthew 2.11, when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their presents, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. That's the first time and an important time that the word ice is used in the New Testament when it says they came into the house, when they were come into ice, the house. So they had come to the house 
where the Lord was. And they didn't just stand on the outside. And, and they didn't just believe that Jesus was in the house. They didn't stand on the outside and ask someone to carry their gifts into the house. They went into the house, Matthew 2.11. They went into ice, the house. And that picture shows the meaning of the word ice and why it's so important when the Lord says in John 6.40, John 6.40, this is the will of him that sent me that everyone would see at the sun and believeth ice, believeth into him, may have everlasting life and I'll raise him up at the last day. So you see that picture of the wise men when they come to the house where Jesus was, they're believing into Jesus, they're believing into ice. Jesus meant that they didn't just stand on the outside of the house where Jesus was with a firm belief. Jesus is God, Jesus is there, Jesus is gonna die for our sins, he's gonna rise again. Believing into Jesus was for them entering into the house. Believing into Jesus is not just standing on the outside and sending gifts. It's entering into ice, the house. This is the same word that's used in John 3.16, John 3.16, where it says, For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth ice in, into him should not perish but have everlasting life. So that raises the question, well, what does that mean? What does that mean to believe into Jesus? What does that mean to be like the wise men and enter into the house, spiritually speaking about Jesus. It means to be like those wise men when they entered the house in Matthew 2.11, Matthew 2.11, they, it says, they fell down and worshiped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So believing ice into Jesus means to worship the Lord Jesus and give him all, surrender all. Believing into ice, believing ice into Jesus means to have a life of Galatians 2.20. Galatians 2.20, where it's a life of, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So to believe in Jesus, to believe into Jesus means to be crucified with Christ and to have Christ living inside the person. To believe Ice into Jesus means to have a life of Galatians 5.24. Galatians 5.24. They that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. To believe into Jesus means to crucify the lust, personal lust. To believe into ice Jesus means to have a life of Colossians 3.3. Colossians 3.3. You are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. So that means that to believe into Jesus is to have a secret hidden life with Christ. To believe ice, to believe into Jesus, means to have a life of 2 Corinthians 13.5. 2 Corinthians 13.5. Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know, know you not your own selves how that Christ, how that Jesus Christ is in you. Know you not how that Jesus Christ is in you. To believe into Jesus means to have Jesus Christ living inside the person to believe, to believe ice into Jesus means to have a life of 1 John 5, 12. 1 John 5, 12, he that hath the Son hath life. That means to believe into Jesus means to have the Lord Jesus Christ. To believe in, in, in Jesus, to believe into Jesus means to have a life of John 15, 5. John 15, 5, where he said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. That means that to believe into Jesus means to abide in Christ, knowing that without him, nothing can be done. To believe into Jesus, to believe into Jesus means to have a life of Philippians 121. Philippians 121, which just simply says, for me to live is Christ. To believe into Jesus means to have a life where Christ is living out his life through that person. So, all of these things stacked up means it's very dangerous to assume that there is a back door for backsliders to get into heaven. It's very dangerous for a person to assume, well, I'm saved, I prayed the prayer, I know I'm not living a real life with Jesus, I know I'm part of that group that's backsliding, but they're gonna get to heaven, there's a back door for backsliders, and once I'm in heaven, it's gonna be so great. Very dangerous position. Now, <clears throat> We can learn a lot about the self-deception from, the, from, from uh, these people 
who are, who are being cast into hell by looking at what they said. Looking at what they said in Matthew 7, 22. Matthew 7, 22, verse 22. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. So the key to identifying self-deception that leads to this being cast into hell is this one word in that verse, and it's the word we, we. So he says, in, in, in Matthew 7, 22, he says, have, not, we, have we not prophesied? And by implication, we cast out devils. By implication, we done many wonderful works. See, the group of self, the self-deceived are making three arguments for why they should be led into heaven, and all of these three arguments center on what they have done. They're basing their arguments for why they should be led into heaven on their own works. They've been, prof- they've been preaching and, and, they, and, 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 on, that's a wor- and on their works of casting out devils and on their works of doing many, many wonderful works. They are relying on that. They're trusting in that. They're trusting in the record of their works. It's all about works, works, works. It's the same today. If you ask a typical person why they, why they should be led into heaven, they'll say, I'm a good person. I've done good things. I've been, I give to charity. I haven't murdered anyone. It all starts with the word I, in their case with the word we. And then they go on to say whether they have done or they haven't done. It's all about works. And this is exactly what the Bible says is not the basis for being led into heaven. In Ephesians 2.8, Ephesians 2.8, where it says, for by grace are you saved through faith. Not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Salvation is by the grace of God, not from our own works. We are not the result of our workmanship. It says in Ephesians 2.10, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. So the reason that God does not allow anyone into heaven based on their works, he said, it was in Ephesians 2.9, Ephesians 2.9, not of works, lest any man should boast. God doesn't want any boasting. He doesn't want anybody to boast. And you look at this group here in verse 22, and you can see they're already boasting. They're boasting about their works. They say, Lord, Lord, have not we prophesied in thy name? Thy name cast out devils, and thy name done many wonderful works. They're already boasting. They haven't even gotten to heaven yet. And we can imagine how if they had gotten to heaven, they would meet people and they would say, hi, I, I prophesied, I preached in the name of Jesus and my church ran about 1,000 every Sunday. Yeah? And they would say, hi, I cast out devils from, from people in the name of Jesus. I put my hands on them, prayed, out came the demons. Hi, I did many wonderful works in the name of Jesus. God hates that. He hates that kind of boasting. And so he says, I'm not going to have anybody boast in front of me. The only argument for getting to heaven is to look into the face of Jesus. And just like I look into your faces right now, let's just picture there was a big group of people here. And there's Don, and he's among the people group. And I'm sort of scanning the people, and all of a sudden I see, hey, I know you, Don. (laughs) And Don looks at me and says, yeah, oh, wow. That's the basis. It's this mutual knowledge. That's where he he says in, in, in John 10, 14, John 10, 14, I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. I know Don. Don knows me. And when we scan and all of a sudden, it's that smile. It's that, hey, I see somebody. The 2 Timothy 2.19, 2 Timothy 2.19. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. 1 Corinthians 8.3. 3, Corinthians 8.3. If any man love God, the same is known of him. Now, to emphasize further that how, how to not be cast into hell from self-deception, the Lord then goes on to tell this parable of two people that built two houses. One of them built the house on the rock. The other one built their house on the sand. The storm came to both of them, and the house on the rock stood. The house on the sand fell. So the question really is, what made the difference between the house standing and not standing? It's obviously the rock. The one had the rock, the other one didn't have the rock. And so the question then becomes, what's the rock? What is the rock that, that keeps the house from falling? The rock is Mark 12.10, Mark 12.10. Have you not read this scripture? 
the stone or the rock which the builders rejected is become the head of the corner. The rock is Christ. He is the rock. In, in Psalm 32, 6, it talks about a storm. Psalm 32, 6, This shall every one that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. Surely in the floods of great waters there shall not come nigh unto him. But on the other hand, <clears throat> those on the sand, Psalm 73, 19, Psalm 73, 19, how are they brought into desolation as in a moment they are utterly consumed with terrors? So the bottom line of his teaching kind of goes along this line. Faith and a personal relationship, or a personal, which results in a personal surrender, makes a believer. Life proves that a person is a believer. Trials confirm that a person is a believer. And, and finally, death will crown that person with eternal life. And the response to all of his teaching was that it was so different. It was so different from the scribes. It was a, it, that, that's how this, this chapter ends. The, people are astonished because they never heard these things before because the scribes appeared to have power from God, but they didn't. The scribes appeared to have authority from God, but they didn't. He had the power. He had the authority. The people recognized it. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for how clear he is in his, his teaching. Lord, thank you for how he doesn't leave us or anyone hanging as to what he meant and how to enter in and be pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen.